All right, so we're going to do two chapters tonight, EMS operations, and uh, which we could blow through pretty fast. The next chapter is pretty long and difficult. It gets into uh, uh, quite a few things. All right, so what we've talked about before, your job as an EMT is going to be preparing the ambulance for a call. You're going to be alert and respond to the call. You're going to be in charge of transferring the patient to the ambulance and, and then back again to the hospital. You'll have to get become uh, accustomed to working with the uh, uh, emergency uh, room operations and uh, staff, uh, befriend them, become a friend of them. Once they understand you and that you are uh, conscientious and a good employee, you'll get a lot of respect and they won't, uh, <clears throat> they'll understand and, and go by what you say and it'll be a lot better for you. So don't ask, act a fool when you go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. All right, now this is, uh, there, are four types of, uh, there are four types of ambulances. And you'll see these, and they're pictured on, um, on page uh, four, 976 in your book. All right, when, when I started, there was only uh, three, three types of ambulances. Now, you'll prob I've seen these questions on quizzes before. Typically, the way that I, I go by this, type one is basically what that is, is a chassis truck, and they, put a, they call this the box. The ambulance in the back where you're going to be, they call that the box. So they've taken a truck, instead of putting a, a tow truck or a, a flatbed or whatever on it, they've put an a ambulance box. And what you'll have right there is you just have a window and uh, a sliding window there and so you talk back and forth to your partner who will be in that. This is type two, type two, the second one, and the way Lyndall and I have always referred to this is like this is the, the bread van. It looks like all this is is a van, just like the Frito guy or the Golden Flake guy might be delivering van, uh, potato chips. And all they've done is they've, they've taken the roof off and they've added about a foot and a half on top of that. That's type two. Type three is a van that uh, without a van back and they've actually added the box to a van. Usually these these two types of ambulances are more in a um, urban city setting where you don't have to go very far. They have low power uh, engines and low uh, uh, suspensions and stuff like that. This, this is a over the road uh, if you were doing transfers from here to Atlanta or something, you would be driving that or something like this. This is what you'll see most fire departments going to is these are heavy duty. Uh, there'll be a big freight liner, uh, a Cummings kind of uh, cab up front, and there's just a lot more room in this box, and they, they may have extrication equipment and things of that nature in there. So that's the type. D or type three, or type D is heavy duty. Remember that heavy duty. All right. All right. So ambulance supplies and equipment. Your job is going to be to know where everything is, uh, even when you go as a uh, as a student. The first thing you want to do is just get in the back and look where everybody puts it. Different par paramedics set their uh, their ambulances off differently. They uh, that one guy may put stuff this place, another guy may put it that place. But it's going to be your responsibility when you're working with these people. When they say, "Hey, get me a uh, uh, get me the suction canister," you know where that is. So if you don't know, the first thing you should do when you get there in the morning is look for that. All right, so as an EMT, as the driver, you want to make sure your vehicle is uh, safe, you've got fuel, uh, all the lights are working. Most, most services give you a daily checkoff list, and then you go right down it and you, you check it off. Then uh, if something's missing, something's broken, 
this a lot of times people will get in trouble about this. Say for example, you lost something. Say you left you left an oxygen cylinder on scene. The the prior crew they forgot to tell you they were rushing out that morning. They forgot to say, hey, oh by the way, we left the cylinder at 123 Main Street. Well, then all of a sudden, then you go on the next call and you've done your check off that morning and you cheated a little bit and you marked that it was on there and then when it shows up that it's missing missing then they're going to come to you because you said it was there when you took the truck over that morning it's usually not on the big equipment it's most likely on the small equipment sort of like like what we were doing last night with the hair traction splint something that you're not using every day somebody will forget it lost it whatever and then you just start going down the list, tick, 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 and, and you really didn't check that it was there, then it's going to come back and, and bite you in the rear. All right, so when you're doing, <clears throat> when you're doing ambulance checkoffs, there's certain things that you're going to check with the engine off. Uh, you're going to check your fluid levels, such as that with the engine off. Then, uh, then the other, other stuff, you're going to want the engine on. You're going to have to check the lights your radio, things of that nature, uh, inspect your patient, patient compartment for supplies and equipment. If something sounds funny, one of the belts are, are singing, uh, uh, you get a tick, 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 ticking sound that you're not normal, you know, lights don't work, gauge is broken, your, your chance to fix it is when you start, you take over that morning. You tell, tell the supervisor that, hey, such and such a, let that be their responsibility if they want to take that unit off service, out of service, or, or don't take that responsibility on yourself. Let somebody else make that decision. Okay, so when we get a call, 911 is going to call, then your, your uh, M, uh, EMD, which is your medical emergency medical dispatcher, will take the call, talk to the, uh, um, the patient or the caller on the line, and then she will, at the same time, most of these, uh, most of the systems at these call centers now, they, they have a keyboard, and while she's talking to the patient, she's keying up a, a call to you and putting out information. Uh, the more, the bigger cities, more advanced uh, operations, it's nice, they, uh, they have a, a, a computer, and they'll get the information as well as over the speakers <coughs> or through the, uh, microphone uh, radio they'll also be getting a uh, readout a computer readout you know have the address and uh, some of them will actually even have GPS on there and they'll show you where the the call is and they'll talk to you but that's in the more advanced series I don't think anybody around here has that All right, so when you operate an ambulance, you're going to probably be the one that's going to drive. <coughs> so your du duties are going to be safe operations. You've got to understand the law. What are we talking about as far as what you can do with lights and sirens? Can you go through a, can you go through a red light without stopping? No. You go through a red light without stopping. You're driving the ambulance. You go through a red light without stopping, looking, clearing it both ways, busting through the light, and you hit somebody. You're going to go to jail, and you're going to get sued. What you all it says is that you've got. The, they want you to clear that. They want you to clear that intersection visually before you go through. These people, by putting your red light and your siren on, you're asking for them to provide you the right of way, all right? Some people uh, don't see you, they have excuses, one excuse or another. I had a partner one time, Lyndall and I were going out of town, my partner, uh, uh, I would have been working with them, we were in, uh, they were coming out of Foley, Alabama, going toward Pensacola, right at the Gulf, uh, at the uh, uh, Bay, uh, Beach Expressway, there's a big intersection there, they had a student in the back, and they, uh, there was two of them up front, and they, they, they came to a light, they were going to a call, and there's, there's two lanes plus a turn lane on all four directions. 
Well, Glenn, they were coming from the west to the east, and a lady was going down Gulf Beach Highway from or, or expressway from the north. The light was green, but all the cars in front of her were stopped. He was going through the intersection with his lights and his sirens going to. She went around all the stopped cars, hit the ambulance in the back of the ambulance, flipped the ambulance over. It broke his it broke his collarbone, and he never he could never work on an ambulance again because he couldn't lift his arm up. The student in the back was thrown, and she broke her arm. And the uh, and the driver broke his back, and when they went to court, they uh, they were liable, and that they they broke, that they did it without due regard. The lady got off. Is what I'm telling you, the lady got off, even though she went around, around all this other traffic. They had their lights and sirens, and she hit them. She hit them. And uh, they lost the lawsuit. So anyway, that's how it goes. Do regard. That's what I'm talking about. All right. So do regard for yourself, your patient, your partner, and for the public. There's no there's no sense uh, in running 105 miles an hour when you can get there almost as fast at 65. Uh, you just got to use your brain on some of this stuff. That's what I'm talking about. When you're busting a light, you are the right of way. You're asking for them to yield the right of way to you. All right, highway safety. This is important. You'll have to. You need to learn and use common sense where you park, where you park your ambulance. Because what you're going to do when you come on scene to a car wreck or something out on the interstate or, or the highways there, you want to park your vehicle where when you get out that you're protected. You don't want to walk across three lanes of traffic. You don't want to cross the medium. You want to pull up behind the vehicle and, and block, block uh, the disabled vehicle or the, the, where the patient is so if somebody comes in they're going to hit your your vehicle and protect you in front of it. Now sometimes you can, if you've got multiple, I always would like, <clears throat> if the fire department was there, I would like to put a, a, a fire engine, I would like to put a fire engine here and I would park in front and then I would walk back because the, the beauty of this is, is your patients, you're going to be loading your patients from the back so you can go straight in here and then if somebody decides they want to not they want to hit somebody they hit a big old fire truck and then you're safe safe here so i'd always park fire trucks behind the incident and you park your ambulance in front if you're without without other resources you just park yours behind it in this this way now you could actually even put it around if you had cones or something but what you've got to do <clears throat> is you've got to provide a vehicle with flashing lights there so that oncoming traffic sees you and uh, uh, they avoid the they avoid the uh, the wreck. You always need to. Uh, I don't know what they've been doing around here. When you go to when you're doing your uh, ride-alongs, are they issuing you a uh, a day glow vest now? Yeah. Huh? We're supposed to take one. Oh, you bought you bought your own. We bought our own, but they do have an extra one on the truck. Yeah, yeah, they're cheaper around here. We uh. We would have, we would have like four on our trucks, you know, uh, one for the driver and the uh, the two partners. Then one if we have a student, and then we'd always have an extra extra one. Um, I've had uh, in Mobile, in Mobile we had a uh, we were working a wreck and uh, we transported the patient, and then there was a policeman. It was a rainy night. He was a motorcycle cop, and uh, he was behind. He was behind the wreck, and uh, after the ambulance left, he uh, was hit and killed by a driver that didn't see him. He didn't have a vest. He didn't have an orange vest on. That, and it, sim shortly after that, they made a, a, a conscious effort to make sure everybody, police and fire and EMS, had uh, vests. Cones are nice. 
Uh, most ambulances around here don't have room to put a cones. They do have, the, they'll have those little uh, triangles. That's where you're hoping that the fire department comes because in the fire department, that's uh, in the back, in the back uh, rolled up, usually that's where they keep their cones. Okay, so four steps in transferring, your, uh, transferring the patient. Select the proper patient carrying device. What does that mean? Stair chair, KED, spine board, uh, uh, stretcher. Yep. So we're packaging the. Now, this is something you got to consider, especially when you get out in the rural area. Uh, if you're out in a farm, you've got a hunting accident or something like that. How are you getting that patient from the woods back to your ambulance? Many cases, many cases, this uh, uh, by taking that stretcher down there, it's not gonna, it's not gonna travel well. It becomes very uh, uh, unstable. You'll flip it over or whatever like that. So you may just end up carrying your uh, backboard down into the woods with you and bring the patient out to the stretcher where it's at a stable, more stable place. So we're going to move the, and then we're going to package the patient uh, like we do. We'll move the patient to the ambulance and then load it in the ambulance. It's your job to make sure that uh, <clears throat> this patient is packaged well, um, all the straps are secured, and they get to the hospital in one piece. All right, so you've got a sick or injured patient, uh, must be packaged so that condition is not aggravated. What we talked about is, is taking your patient in, and transferring them in the position of comfort. You want them to be in a position of comfort and you want to stabilize the injury so that they're not aggravated or uh, it's gotten, gotten any worse. I'll tell you a quick story. We got called one time, we're talking about putting the patient in there having them secured well. I got called for a uh, uh, one on the interstate, on Interstate uh, 65, and it says uh, one for a overturn, and they'll say uh, C, uh, who was that? It was uh, AMR, C -A AMR Ambulance. Well, what had happened is uh, AMR was transporting a patient, and they were riding lights and sirens down the interstate and somebody wasn't paying attention, they pulled in front of the AMR ambulance, the AMR ambulance flipped over, flipped over, and they were in the ditch, like upside down when I pulled up. And uh, both, of, both of the partners were injured. I think one broke his back, one had a broken arm. But the interesting thing to me, the interesting thing to me, they had this lady, and she was actually unconscious. She had a head injury, and I opened the back, I opened the back doors and I looked up there and she was upside down, the stretchers upside down just like that and she's sitting there just like this, fully secured. And so I said, I mean, I was amazed. I didn't think, you know, because the other guys had come out, but they hadn't, they hadn't gotten her down yet. And so I got a bunch of people in there and we released the stretcher, we released the stretcher and, and like and brought her down and had to flip her, flip her over like that. But if you put her in there right, you lock it in there, you've got the three straps on there, they can, she wasn't injured. Now they actually ended, I went on a lawsuit on this one, the, the family sued AMR, uh, the lady died, she ended up dying, but she was, she was, uh, she died from the injuries that she had before. She had fallen and she was on, a, and on the floor for about, uh, about 36 hours before anybody call, uh, uh, went and saw her. She had battle signs, raccoon, raccoon eyes, uh, uh, everything. She had a, a head injury prior to her picking them up and taking her to the hospital. And so, but nothing happened in that wreck that further uh, uh, inhibited her life. When you've got, uh, you've got to always think about that. If you have a wreck, all those things that are in those cabinets are going to come flying around. There you go, minimum of three straps. We used, uh, uh, on the stretcher, you'll have three straps now. Um, I think Alabama's changing some of these 
protocol. Do, around here, do they do in the five straps? Anybody use five straps? You do three straps here and then two straps over the shoulders. And the two straps that come over the shoulders connect to the top strap. And that- Yes, has them, but they don't use them. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> well, in my department, they, they came, they put them on the truck and some people use them, some people, I mean, they're on that, they're on the stretcher every time, but the, what happens is, whoever you work for, it gives you a liability. If they provide you protection equipment like that, and you choose not to use it, then the case that I just told you where that lady, that lady, uh, they flipped over, and that lady was secured, uh, and she was secured properly, she wasn't injured, but if you flipped over and then that lady was injured and then they sued, you're going to get, your service was going to get sued, but you're going to personally get sued too because when you, they're going to put you on that, they're going to put you on the stand, they're going to say, uh, Mr. Curry, did your truck have uh, five straps on the stretcher? Did you have shoulder straps? Yes. Did you have your patient secured? No, I didn't do it that day. I usually just, I, only, I don't very often use those. And they say, oh, okay, boom. The gavel just went down. You just, you just, it just costs you a big buck. Because uh, then you're live, you mm -hmm. know, they've provided, they provided safety equipment and you made the choice not to use it. Here again, you're at, the, like I was telling you, in that case where Glenn's uh, ambulance, uh, I forgot to tell you, Neither Glenn nor his partner in the front, broken back and broken collarbones, guess what? They didn't have a seat belt, uh, seat belt on, seat and shoulder belt on. But the girl, the, the, the girl in the back, the student, you know, hardly any time do you ride in the back with a, uh, uh, a seat belt on, uh, especially if you've got a patient back there. Then she was thrown around, she broke her arm, but, uh, she had a bunch of cuts and bruises from stuff that fell on her. Remain seated. Hey, you got a patient in the back, very seldom you remain seated. You're moving around the whole day. That's just, there's nothing you can do about that. If you're in the back, now if you're in the front driving, you better have that seat belt on. Okay, so preparing the patient for transport, you've loaded her, secure. Now, something else that happens, something else that happens when the ambulance, when you push that stretcher in there, sometimes that latch, the latch, that safety latch won't catch. And I've, I've had this happen many times. You know, somebody's, I've jumped up in the back, some firemen's pushed the, the stretcher up in there, and I'm, Everything's fat, dumb, and happy. I'm going along, and then all of a sudden, they take a turn, and whoom, the stretcher comes over on me. And I'm going, holy cow. So they hadn't secured it good. They didn't, it didn't latch in there. So what you end up doing, you've got to push your foot on the stretcher and then push it back in, in the thing. And you don't want to do that. You've got, you got an IV bag hanging. You've got a, a sharp in your other hand, and all of a sudden, that stretcher comes over on there. So just make sure it's, it's good in place. And if it happens, if it happens, when you get through with the call, make sure there's not something mechanically that's wrong. Sometimes all it needs is a little bit of uh, oil or something on that little latch and it, it secures itself there. Okay, preparing the patient for transport. Make sure that all your equipment's there. Loosen constrictive clothing. Uh, what do we always say? I say uh, expose if you can. You know, especially in trauma, you're gonna have to start uh, uh, removing shoes, removing socks, pants, whatever, uh, so you can find the injury. Here's something, here's something that's always a big problem, personal effects. What happens is, and the biggest thing is, is medications and driver's licenses and, and, and Blue Cross cards. Because what happens is, you want those, you, you tell, tell the family members or whatever, I said, uh, gather up their beds, Give me their, uh, I need their ID and their uh, Blue Cross card. So when I roll in, I stop at administration desk, whoever's doing registration, and I said, here's her, 
here's her Blue Cross card, here's her driver's license. Boom. I've handed it off. Next thing I know, the next day I come to work, hey, uh, Miss Jones says uh, y'all lost her driver's license. And it, it always comes, it, I'm telling you, it comes back to the ambulance. So you've got to prove always that you didn't lose it. Because the hospital said, oh, no, we didn't lose it. EMT didn't give it to us. Paramedic didn't give it to us. They're always going to, it's all, it rolls downhill, guys. And, and you're going to get blamed. So my feeling on personal effects, personal effects is take as little as possible because that means there's a little less that you can leave, lose. The other thing, the, the biggest thing is meds. If somebody is taking lower tab, hydrocodone, morphine, whatever it be, especially narcotics, I don't want them. I don't want to touch them. I, I'll, I'll get a list, I'll write it down. You tell me that she takes them. I always prefer, I always prefer, give me a list of your medicine. Most of these people, some, some paramedics and stuff work this way. Go get a Walmart bag, throw all your medicines in it, and we'll take them to the hospital. The hospital doesn't want to look at every one of those. If I give them a list and I say, these are, these are the eight drugs that she's, these are eight meds that she's taking. That's all they need. What happens if you start taking those meds, the same thing, the same thing happens. I had, a, there was a boy that, uh, that I worked with and uh, somebody lost lower tabs. I don't know whether he took them. I don't know what happened. But the first thing that happened, he, he got fired. He got fired simply because the lower tabs were not, uh, didn't show up. They were gone. Somebody, somebody took them. Well, the easiest thing for them was to fire him. And it took him like six months to get his job back. He finally got it back, but he had to fight it the whole way. So the lesson learned there is take as little as possible and then make sure that you have it organized. If you're taking meds, put them in a bag. Put them in a, a Walmart bag like that. Now, with, with the IDs and Blue Cross, sometimes, and I've, I'm guilty of it too, the lady will give you that and you're busy, you're doing something, and I'll stick it in my pocket and... Then I'll leave the hospital, and I'm, we'll be driving down the road, and I'll do something, and I say, "Oh, I still got her. I still got her ID." And then you got to go back because sometimes, sometimes you can go in, and the lady's busy administration. They'll say, "Go to room six or whatever," and you kind of bypass her. Uh, but I have forgotten, and I've kept people. But luckily, luckily, I've uh, uh, I've been pretty good about it. I've usually figured it out by the time I I've left. The other thing that people leave um, forget is uh, narcotics keys. Y'all got over here? Do they use narcotics keys for the narcotics? They got a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amber. Yeah. The morphine. But well, what'll happen is then you're leaving that morning. You're leaving that morning, and you and you got the uh, uh, the narc keys on your on your belt. And then uh, you forget about it, and you get halfway to uh, Montgomery, and then somebody calls you on the cell phone, hey, man, where are the keys? And you go, oh, you got to turn around, take the keys back. I know it says you want to have a big sign on the door. You've got your medical card, you've got your driver's license, you've got the keys, and you want to say, hey, 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 hey,
most most services they have a, 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 a telephone a, a mobile phone in the front and in the back but my experience is I like to have my own stuff so when I would call the hospital on my personal cell phone I had all the numbers that I needed to call and I just boom I just hit it and I didn't even mess with our phones mess with our phones because I felt like most cases they weren't not as, as uh, reliable <coughs> Safe practices, that would be driving with due regard. Okay, here we go. Transferring to patients' personal effects. I'm telling you, it, it happens every day, every day. You know, they think, the patient thinks that you've got it, you've got this, you got that. So the best rule is take, take as little as possible. As soon as uh, you're free, as soon as you, you're going to take the patient in, you're going to move her to bed six, you're going to wheel your st stretcher out, you're not going to stop and talk to 18 different people, go on out to the ambulance and, and get your uh, stretcher, stretcher ready, clean the back, have everything ready. Okay, in case you get that a call, then you're ready to go. Then you can go back in and do all your socializing when you, uh, when you got your ambulance ready. Now, one thing that you'll get, uh, one thing that um, an EMS that everybody's real paranoid about uh, is is blood. And when you get a real a bloody patient, you're gonna find blood everywhere. You see, like where he's uh, I don't know why my little there it is. You've got a stainless steel. This is like a stainless steel sheet right here. I've had I've. I've spent 30 and 40 minutes cleaning out the back of the ambulance with blood, and then the next, then you think you got it, and the next time you st stand on that little stainless steel plate, uh, blood just gush, gushes out from underneath it. So sometimes it just takes a lot. I've had to take screws out of those plates there and take that, that, that uh, stainless steel plate out and clean up underneath there to get the blood out. <clears throat> so when you get back to the station, Remember what you used. If you used a suction canister, you used a, uh, you, when you got your last C collar out, you noticed that there was, uh, that was the last no neck or whatever. Go ahead and as soon as you get back, replace it. Replace it. As soon as you get ready, uh, what, what our policies, where I've worked before, as soon as, uh, as, soon as it's in service, when you get, when you get the, uh, you've taken the patient in, you get back out and your ambulance is ready for call, you're supposed to call the dispatch and tell them that uh, uh, you're available. You just say Med 6 is available for call. Then they know, then if a call comes up, boom. Many times, many times you'll get, when they're busy, you'll be in the hospital and you'll get, you'll get a call They'll, be, they'll have a call holding for you and they say you, you need to get in service, you need to get in. So some cases like that you have to rush real quickly and you may not have everything completely redone but that's why it's important to, uh, to prepare as soon as you can. Oh, what does it say there? Air out ambulance if necessary for odor control. Uh, you'll get some uh, stinky patients and uh, what you can do is what you can do is you can run. There's a uh, a vent a vent fan. Run the vent fan, and usually on the doors they'll have uh, they have sliders. You can do the sliders like that, and uh, that'll that'll aerate the thing. And then most places have uh, air fresh. You spray some air fresh in there. And for yourself, a good thing to do is uh, if you have if you run into a call where this the odor is just really bad, it's sickening, what you're smelling. You can take uh, alcohol pads, you know, the little individual alcohols, we tear them, you can tear them and you can stick those up in your nose and uh, it, it overpowers the, uh, the smell that you're smelling. A couple other things you can do is you can take, uh, you, you know, you can't carry everything. You'd have, end up having a book backpack but uh, I've had partners, and that I've got something now. It's just got a, like a little roller thing, and it's got a, it's got a, a real nice smell, and it opens up your sinuses. 
but you can have something that like that in your pocket and you can just push that underneath your nose and uh, that does the trick. Vicks Vapor Rub, something like that. Okay, uh, badly contaminated linens, uh, those go in the red bag. Anything that's, uh, that's a biohazard goes into the red bag. Uh, you want to clean the equipment, any equipment that's got blood on it, it's going to need to be washed and desanitized. All right, so air rescue. All right, so you're, most of the time <clears throat> when you're involved with a helicopter, what you're having to do, you're having to meet the helicopter someplace. Because of landing restrictions, um, many times they can't land on scene. And so what you'll do is you'll load the patient up and you'll go to where the, uh, the, the helicopter is. And most of the time you're not really involved in that. Other times, they, if you've got a bad, a real bad patient, the, uh, uh, I've had, I've had uh, and I'm busy, I've got many patients. I've had them, somebody bring the crew to me, and then they're helping me in the back as we're riding back to their, uh, their ambulance. Uh, around here, trauma centers, major trauma is uh, not handled that well locally. L like many people choose to fly to Columbus, Birmingham, or Atlanta if they had ma major trauma or burns or something, something like that. But uh, you can make that decision. You wouldn't make that decision. The paramedic would do. Uh, here again, you may be involved some, but if, if there's a helicopter, usually protocol is that there's got to be a fire truck there. And so whoever the fire service is, they're going to be handling that. They'll set up the landing zone. They're going to be talking to the uh, uh, helicopter. <coughs> They tell them where the location is and such as that. You probably won't be involved with that. When they set up the landing zone, uh, you'll. Uh, this is probably the minimum. They're going to want a, a hundred foot by hundred foot, and they want it where there's a there's minimal slope, less than eight degrees, and they're going to land. They're going to land into the wind, and they're not going to want any. Uh, power lines, obstructions, things like that. So whoever's choosing the landing zone, they've got to uh, they've got to be aware. And what they'll do is usually the helicopter will come around and they'll circle once or twice. And he's looking down and he's deciding whether he wants to land there. He may tell you that that's not a suitable landing area and he wants you to uh, to find another one. At that point, you know, uh, that might be where you send out somebody else to do that. Y'all didn't know my picture was on here, did you? <laughs> that's, what, that's when my mustache was longer. All right, so chapter review. Inspect the vehicle to ensure that it is complete. Critical time can be located. Uh, uh, critical items. Uh, the laws in most states allow the driver of emergency vehicle running hot to break some of the vehicle and traffic laws. However, it must be done with due regard. That's the key word there, <laughs> due regard. If they... If they think that you were going too fast based on somebody sprained their ankle over at the intramural fields at Auburn and you were going 105 miles an hour down Auburn Opelika Highway, they, you're going to get fried because you weren't doing it in due regard. That person is not dying. They don't need, they don't need that kind of uh, transport. Pay attention. Don't be texting. Don't be talking on your phone. Uh, uh, secure all your gear. Always wear your seatbelt. I told you this example of two people that I know, and that one wreck that didn't wear the seatbelt, and they, and they, I mean, they, they should have been smarter than that. Pre-call inspections to ensure readiness and appropriate equipment. Uh, be, be respectful to uh, your dispatchers because. I'm telling you, if you make them mad, they're going to burn you. They're going to give you every call. So, so if sometimes they can be dispatchers can be a little bit annoying. They don't give you the kind of information that you would like. If you go back and forth with them to get the information, but remember, 
they they are in control because they can start sending you on every call and they can make your days miserable. So try and be um, try and be respectful of them. The uh, did Lindell ever tell you the story? What I told one of the dispatchers that time. Um, we were called. I was called to the scene, and and, and they say, uh, what, what what was on Med Six? Med Six. Uh, go to Robertsdale for one uh, one seat, uh, one injured. And so, many times when you get the first call, it's it's vague. And then because they're still talking to the the patient, you know how I told you they type in and stuff. So. So uh, anyway, so we're in route, and then they come back on. He says, you're responding to a 49-year-old male complaining of toe pain. And I said, 10-9? She, I said, what? What pain? And she said, toe pain. And so then I went back on. I said, it sounds like she needs a tow truck. He needs a tow truck rather than an ambulance. Anyway, I got, I got in trouble about that, but everybody got a big kick out of it. Y'all didn't think it was funny. Y'all probably don't understand it. <laughs> most, most of you are still asleep. So anyway, but you can do some stuff like that. But what ends up happening is, is if the supervisors listen to you, then they call you up, hey, you can't talk like that on the radio. I, I, you know. But you gotta, you, you've been working for 24 hours. You've got to have a little bit of fun. All right, this is just a review of what we said. Select the proper uh, patient carrying device, packaging pa patients for transfer, moving patients to the ambulance. Those are the four steps. Your job is to clean the ambulance, replace use supplies and equipment, ready the ambulance and stretcher. Uh, that's all about protocol and air transport. <coughs> All right. So, if you got, if you had somebody that had an ATV accident, and uh, they were out in the woods over there, and you couldn't take your stretcher, what do you think you might need to carry to scene with you uh, to expedite the transfer of that patient? Backboard blocks, jump bag. Backboard blocks, jump bag, and one other thing, seat collar. What about what about an airway bag with had oxygen in it. I'd probably take that too. Maybe some, uh, what What everybody usually does, we used to have what we call an airway bag. We had an airway bag, and then we had a trauma bag, and then you can, in the trauma bag you had bandages and uh, gauze and stuff like that. There you go, the end. Now, this one was quick and easy. The next one is gonna take some time, so take your break. I know Cindy's got, She's going to get on me because I've been an hour and five minutes. Remember to use the slide thing. Oh, I got to stop the, how do I stop the talk thing? Okay. You don't have to. I'm going to stop. Wait, I got to do this. No, the little button.